Hyperborea. Hyperborean's name comes from the ancient Greek, means beyond the north wind. Their gods were called the Titan, six males and six female deities. They were known to be very benevolent in a time known as the Golden Age. But they were capricious and disappeared without a trace. The civilization has been described in many cultures as being very tall, blue-eyed, blonde, and fair-skinned, with a well-developed and organized society. One of his many talents are arts and science. Its inhabitants live in a state of permanent light and love. In fact, it is a race that has always lived without war. His concept of work is unparalleled. Their highest crime was an emotional betrayal. Their genetic knows no age or disease. They are highly psychic beings. Another part of Greek history connects the Hyperboreans with the founding of several major religious shrines in ancient Greece. It is also said in these writings that the planet would be connected by tunnels throughout the interior of our planet. Different cultures around the world agree in their ancient writings that mankind originated in Hyperborea. The ancient breed has the same origin as the Atlantean and Lemurian of extraterrestrial origin. Today a part of this civilization is hidden inside the planet. Scientists have confirmed that there are openings at the poles which would serve as inputs to an advanced hidden world. Considering this theory, the ancient Greek legend would make sense. Some researchers claim that the Hyperboreans lived for a time with other breeds like Atlanteans and Lemurians and its most intense relationship with the Atlanteans, whose allies exchanged part of their science and astronomy. Hyperborea is not a legend. There remains, first, remember that this region, as well as the two continents lost, have not ceased to exist since there are its buildings in the deep ocean, as has been recently demonstrated. They speculate that at some point in the history of mankind, these continents may re-emerge to the surface. Moreover, not all Hyperboreans disappeared in the Great Catastrophe. A part of their society was safe, forewarned of the impending destruction of their civilization. This happened before the two continents, Lemuria and Atlantis, and the region of Hyperboreans were swallowed by the waters by a shift in the Earth's axis. For a while, they prepared their migration into the planet. One of these places is Mount Shasta, California. Some of these descendants eventually, in the course of our history, were surfacing and adopting to different parts of the world, migrating to the southern lands, mixing with other ethnic groups of people of different regions of the world. Quetzalcoatl and possibly Pythagoras set out with fellow Hyperboreans across the world to help rebuild civilization such as Iceland and mainland Europe as well as the lands of India, Himalaya or the American continent providing expertise in mathematics, esoteric wisdom, astronomy, etc. The White Island, Hyperborea, is the only place that escaped the general fate of all continents after the disaster cannot be destroyed by water or fire as it is in the eternal earth. Perhaps the most famous healer of the Hyperboreans was a man named Abaris. He was given a magical arrow by the god Apollo on which he flew around the world performing miracles. Really. Abaris the Hyperborean, son of Sooth, was a legendary sage, healer, and priest of Apollo known to the ancient Greeks. He was supposed to have learned his skills in his homeland, Hyperborea, and he was endowed with the gift of prophecy. By this, as well as by his Scythian dress of simplicity and honesty, he created a great sensation in Greece and was held in high esteem. Can't find any new information on the arrow. They're all phrased the same from the same stock writer. Frustrating. This is the race that humans would aspire to be, to be at their best.
Abaris aligned souls to their divine nature and through geometric spheres and music he performed what he called soul adjustments. Abaris practiced medicine on the soul as well as on the body by means of incantations. Sound creates matter, cold frequencies which are constructed in an ice grid for planet sustainability. This was well known. Hyperboreans knew the process of planet Earth evolution and ascension to new frequency. Their technology was designed to make harmonic ascension of the planet in life. Hyperboreans had conscious about our animal soul, the vehicle or body of desires and passions in the astral form of humankind after death. This enigmatic paradise was guarded by powerful races of demigods called Hyperboreans. This land was supposed to be perfect, the sun shining 24 hours a day. It is possible the Hyperborea had no real physical location at all, for according to classical Greek poet Pindar, neither by ship nor on foot would you find the marvelous road to the assembly of the Hyperboreans. In Saturn theory, the celestial north was the abode of the gods. This road to the assembly of the Hyperboreans. Pendar also described the otherworldly perfection of the Hyperboreans. Never the muse is absent from their ways. Fires clash and flutes cry, and everywhere maiden chorus is whirling. Neither disease nor bitter old age is mixed in with their sacred blood. Far from the labor of battle they live. The earliest extant source that mentions Hyperborea in detail, Herodotus's Histories, Book 4, Chapters 32-36, dates from circa 450 BC. However, Herodotus recorded three earlier sources that supposedly mention the Hyperboreans, including Hesiod and Homer. The later purportedly having written of Hyperborea in his lost work Epigani, if that be really a work of his. Herodotus also wrote of Scythians, who are estimated to have lived in the Kazakh steppe. Beyond these live the one-eyed Armispians. We know them as the Cyclops. I'm gonna have to do a show on the Cyclops. Further on, the gold-guarding griffin. You weak-minded fool! <laughs> and beyond these, the Hyperboreans, Herodotus assumed that Hyperborea lay somewhere in Northeast Asia. Pindar, contemporaries of Herodotus in the 5th century BC, each briefly described or referenced the Hyperboreans in their works. The Hyperboreans were believed to live beyond the snowy Rippian Mountains, According to Posancius, men living beyond the home of Boreas. Homer placed Boreas north of Thrace in Dacia. Other ancient writers, however, believe the home of the Boreas or the Danube, Rapian Mountains, were in a different location. For example, Hecateus of Miletus believed that the Rapian Mountains, the Rapian? Rapian Mountains, were adjacent to the Black Sea. Alternatively, Pendar placed the home of Boreas, the Raphian Mountains, and Hyperborea all near the Danube, in contrast to the Raphian Mountains with the Alps and the Hyperboreans as a Celtic tribe who lived just beyond them. Aristotle placed the Raphian Mountains on the borders of Scythia and Hyperborea further north. Hecateus of Abdera and others believed Hyperborea was Britain. Later, Roman and Greek sources continued to change the location of the Raphian Mountains, the home of Boreas, as well as Hyperborea, supposedly located beyond them. However, all these sources agreed that these were all in the far north of Greece, and the kings of this Hyperborean city and the supervisors of the sacred precinct are called Boreandi. Thus, they are thought to be around 10 feet tall, 3 meters, who ruled Hyperborea. Later classical sources, Plutarch, writing in the 1st century AD, connected the Hyperboreans with the Gauls who had sacked Rome. To the Greeks and Romans, where Pliny, Pendar, and Herodotus 
as well as Virgil and Cicero reported that the people lived to the age of 1,000 and enjoyed lives of complete happiness. What do we know about that with Saturn theory? Is that the Earth was much more protected from harmful cosmic radiation due to the denser atmosphere with more oxygen and less gravity. Hecateus of Abdera collated all the stories about the Hyperboreans, current in the 4th century BC, and published a lengthy treatise on them, lost to us, but noted by Diodorus Siculus. Also, the sun was supposed to rise and set only once a year in Hyperborea, which would place it above or upon the Arctic Circle, more generally the Arctic Pole. The ancient Greek writer Theopompus, in his work Philippica, claimed Hyperborea was once planned to be conquered by a large race of soldiers from another island. Some have claimed this was Atlantis. The plan, though, was abandoned because the soldiers from Merophis realized the Hyperboreans were too strong for them and the most blessed of people. This unusual tale, which some believe was satire or comedy, was preserved by Alien. Huh, Alien, that's funny. Alien. Alien. Theasus visited the Hyperboreans and Pindar transferred Perseus' encounter with Medusa there from its traditional site of Libra. Always trying to add the schism or the disconnect Colonists wrote that the Argonauts sighted Hyperborea when they sailed through the Eridanos. 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 Physical appearance. The Greek legend asserts that the Bereids, who were the descendants of Bereas, the snow nymph Chione, founded the first theocratic monarchy on Hyperborea. This legend is found preserved in the writings of Elian. The god Apollo or Apollon, known to the Greeks, has a priest, the son of Boreas, the sons of Boreas, Northwind, and Sione, Snow, three in number, brothers by birth, and six cubits in height, about three meters. And the kings of this Hyperborean city and the supervisors of the sacred precinct are called Boreandi, since they are descendants of Boreas, and the succession to these positions is always kept in their family. H.P. Bofatsky, René Gignon, Julius Evola all shared belief in the Hyperborean polar origins of mankind and a subsequent solidification and de-evolution. According to these esoterists, Hyperborea was the golden age, polar center of civilization and spirituality. Man does not rise from the ape, but progressively devolves into ape-like condition as it strays physically and spiritually from its mystical otherworldly homeland in the far north, succumbing to the demonic energies of the South Pole, the greatest point of materialization. See Jocelyn Godwin, Arctos, the Polar Myth, and Robert Sharo related the Hyperboreans to an ancient astronaut race reputedly very large, very white people who had chosen the least warm area on the earth because it corresponded more closely to their own climate on the planet from which they originated. I would think that the Rithian Mountains were more likely the Caucasus Mountains. That seems to make more sense. But we know from Saturn theory that the North Pole was a paradise at one time. Conan the Barbarian, Hyperborea, is to the northeast of his homeland in Cimmeria. His brow was low and broad, his eyes a volcanic blue that smoldered as if with some inner fire. His dark, scarred, almost sinister face was that of a fighting man.
races always start at their golden age, where kindness and abundance are at their zenith, and then they spiral downward toward the opposite. The Hyperboreans, or Hyperboreans, became more physical. At one time they could fly and did not have to eat, but eventually they were taken away. Their skin was said to be blue on some occasions. They could perceive the truth of the universe. The experiment to become detached and that led to having hard hearts. It led to their demise. It's funny, it's kind of happening to humanity today. We're becoming less and less human. They valued their own survival over helping others. Those Hyperboreans that would not repent their hardness of heart were eliminated by hurricanes. It is said that Jupiter is responsible for the four seasons and the sun and Jupiter conspired to boot Saturn from the inner solar system. Shiva is the great destroyer, the shell cracker. Destruction is needed for new growth. Mainstream science tries to make us believe that origins of life take a long, long time, as in millions to billions of years. Velikovsky found the bomb craters in England during the Blitz. Brand new species of flowers would be found growing in the craters within days. What does that say? Well, in mythology, uh, the, it, there's rivalry between those two planets and it's, um, it's usually um, portrayed as two brothers, twin brothers or um, a male and a feminine uh, aspect. Uh, for instance, uh, Jesus and Mary Magdalene, or Jesus and Satan, you see? And Saturn always gets to play the uh, negative part because Saturn is... The relationship between Saturn and the Sun is this. The Sun is the primary of the solar system right now. But probably around about 15,000 years ago, it was Saturn. And um, Saturn, according to the scientists at uh, thunderbolts.info, uh, Wallace Thornhill and those guys there, uh, the position of Saturn was in a northerly position. It was the sun of this solar system. And it was in a coaxial relationship with the Earth. And in between Saturn and the Earth, there was uh, Venus and Mars. So it was a coaxial relationship, you see. And Saturn was always in the northern heavens as the sun of this solar system. Then 15,000 years ago, there was a, uh, a switch. This sun turns up. Um, now, Saturn's orbit takes 29 and a half years. And that's the magic number, because it relates to the sun. 29 years relates to the Earth in 29 and a half day cycles. So you see this powerful relationship between the Earth and the Moon, the sisters, Isis and Nephthys, you know, and they are in a phase lock sort of orbit with each other, but it's very powerful. And the Moon is very influential over this orb, the Earth, her sister, and it causes the, the tides and things like that, or at least it affects that, and we see the effect of the Moon with people on full moons with insanity and uh, etc. All of those things. Well, Saturn does the same with the Sun. And astrologers know that um, when Saturn is in transit, meaning when Saturn is in a position in your birth chart where you might have some certain frictions like afflictions, okay, now this is astrological language but it's still science. When Saturn comes to those returns, those transits and stuff like that, uh, people notice it. They notice it. People who are aware. Not the average person. They don't know anything about this, but astrologers know the effect of Saturn. They know the effect of the Moon, primarily. These two are the most powerful, without a doubt, in the solar system and in astrology. So, but in mythology, you'll find that one is um, electric and one is magnetic. Uh, it's always like that. The relationship is always like that. And I'm pointing out the fact that L, which is um, the word, well, electricity derives from L, 
El is one of those words that turns up in the mythologies all the time. You have Emmanuel, Israel, the Bible, uh, Babel, the bell for Baal that you have in the chapel and steeple and cathedral and you know you go to the altar to worship El or Allah. All of these L words that have to do with masculinity because the letter L is Lamed in Hebrew and it is erect. It is the male phallic, the obelisk. So, and that is pretty much the sun. It's a sundial and the sun is phallic. L, Elohim or Elios. But Saturn also gets the title of L. So there's always this friction between... Saturn is known as Baal or Bael or Bel or um, just plain old L. And you see, Jesus was called in Matthew 1 verse 23, and the virgin shall give a child, and we shall call his name Emmanuel. Well, Emmanuel, Jesus Emmanuel, that is, he's got a friend, a dark friend called Mag. Deline. Interesting about that, isn't it? L and mag, electricity and magnetism. So you see how these characters turn up. And by the way, Mary Magdalene, I mean, Mary's a dead giveaway. Mary is maritime, marine, all those water words. You know, M is the crest of the wave, actually. You know, the water, the waves, M. And in fact, the Hebrew letter M, Mem, for M, means water. So... I think there is something to the Hyperboreans. I think they might get overlooked a little bit more because the Atlanteans get so much praise constantly, and it could be them. But there's something about this Hyperborean race that makes me want to connect them to many things, like cro man Gentle Giants, Vikings, no doubt later, a race that might just be watching us and could quite possibly intermingle with us still. There's a big difference between an extraterrestrial and an alien, and that's something I never gave much thought to before. It is totally possible that a race could have gone underground. I mean, we would, if something happened. What's so far-fetched about it? When you look at man's development through the ancient times to modern times, the progress is not linear like mainstream tries to say. But there is a time when it seems that the older something was, the better it was. And that can really only be explained by a decline in knowledge, a survivor race that spread out and helped bring the survivors back to some kind of civilization. And of course, they had a lot of knowledge, but as they passed away, the knowledge slowly degraded and that's exactly what we see in the architecture and the megalith monoliths or megaliths or all the stone buildings i want to comment further in fact i have an entire editorial or analysis if you will but it's going to have to wait for next episode I'm trying to keep these short i want to share a story with you that I've never shared with anyone ever before. The only person that's ever known this since 1967 is me. Oh, I might have told my son, but that'd be about it. It's on why I feel that we have another plane of existence, an afterlife, astral plane, whatever you want to call it. It's a childhood memory I have of going to the beach with my mom, something that I probably could count on one hand that I did with her through my whole childhood. Maybe even once or twice, and that was about it. Rare occurrence. Usually went with my friends, but I was still too young. I was about eight years old. I wanted to swim with my raft, but my raft had a hole in it. And somehow, you know, I don't know how it got, you know, those things always got holes in them. You had to blow up the pillow and the body separately. Well, the body had a hole in it and it was worthless, but the pillow still worked. So being the natural adaptive, resourceful kid that I was. I just put that pillow under my arm and started kicking out toward the buoys. I swear I remember it as if it was yesterday and it was 1967. This is Lake St. Clair. When you look at the Lake of Michigan, it's the tiny little puddle compared to the other lakes, but it's not a puddle when you're there. And to a seven or eight year old kid, everything was just extremely massive. I swear to God, 
when I go there today and I look at it, I think they must have drained the lake and made everything miniature. But anyways, I was kicking out to the buoys, and I got this bright idea when I got out there finally. I still can't believe it's that close when I look at it now, but I wanted to see how deep the water was. So I thought I'd just slip out from my pillow, you know, and touch the bottom and come back up. That was my plan anyway. But when I let go of the pillow, the pillow went off with a whoosh and it was a little windy too there was some waves and it whooshed away from me and the current was taking it the other way and i was panicking I, when i went down for the second time i thought that was it i remembered thinking in my mind my mom's gonna really be sad when she finds out <laughs> but uh when i came up for the third time that pillow was right there for me to grab and i have thought my whole life that that something or somebody put that pillow there there was no way that the wind could have blown it around in a circle, but you know, I never once felt that bottom with my toe, and I was feeling, and I think that's what freaked me out, but I learned to never panic, because if you do, you're a goner. I never did that again. <laughs> I also never told my mom. I think I would have aged her 10 years. Until now, the only ones that knew about that was me and my guardian angel. So I'm convinced of an astral world, or plane, or whatever you want to call it. When we hear things that are wacky or out there, we only judge that based on information that we have picked up from sources that want us to think like that. In order to think outside of the box, you have to get outside of the box. We're programmed by the media to feel fear 24-7, and I reject that in every way, shape, and form. Uh, just one more thing. If you like the show, please donate a buck or two to help with costs.